Hello, I'm Anastasia Marchinkova, and today I'm going to talk to you about quantum computing and the one weird trick to breaking RSA cryptography called Shor's algorithm. So I'm going to cover Quantum 101, uh, the current status of quantum computers, uh, the roadmap that we have to 10 million qubits, Shor's algorithm and how it works, and the risk to the current encryption standards that we have now and how we mitigate them with post-quantum and quantum cryptography and even a little bit about the skill sets that you need to get involved with quantum computing in the future. And uh, please ask questions while I'm doing this presentation uh, so I can cover them at the end. And just any questions that you have, just toss them in uh, and we will get to them at the end. So uh, I'm a quantum researcher at Lexmo and we are building application specific quantum chips or quantum ASICs accelerators as we call them. So I've been in the quantum computing field for over 12 years now. And I started my work in 2009, researching quantum telecommunication at Georgia Tech. And my work was in increasing the coherence time or the length of time that quantum information could be stored in neutral rubidium atoms. And we even proved that quantum entanglement could be preserved when transitioning these photons to different wavelengths. And that was kind of a research that kind of helped other quantum computing uh, modalities or hardware uh, expand and, and work my research into into their own research as well. So then I went to the University of Maryland for my PhD and I really got really excited about quantum computing's move into the industry because when I started, that wasn't really happening. Since then I worked in two uh, quantum computing companies using superconducting qubits. And now I'm also a YouTuber doing quantum computing with the vision of getting more people actually excited for and using quantum computing now that this has all moved beyond the lab. So take, for example, Shor's algorithm, which we're going to cover here, which is often kind of the first algorithm that people hear about when learning about quantum. And Shor's algorithm is kind of the key to the future of cybersecurity. And it really shows and leverages the differences between quantum and classical computing's approaches to factoring numbers. So quantum isn't new. So even though the industry and there's a lot of hype going on right now, quantum is actually not new. And a hundred years ago, we started seeing that the world is quantum. We started seeing weird effects in some experiments that could not be explained by natural laws. And these are non-classical correlations. So meaning that quantum physics violates the classical laws of nature. And let me tell you, Einstein hated this and he did not believe it because it was kind of inconvenient and it disproved the laws that we thought we knew about the world, the classical world. So Einstein incorrectly believed that quantum physics was predetermined, which made it more consistent with the, the world of classical computing. Um, but quantum is its own thing. So about 40 years ago, we decided we need to harness this power and quantum computing was really proposed in the early 1980s. And they propose this quantum mechanical model of the Turing machine. And Feynman and others later suggested that the quantum computer could actually simulate things that a classical computer could not do and faster. About 30 years ago, we actually discovered the first quantum algorithms. So there's one in 1992 called the deutsch joza algorithm. And it's one of the first examples of quantum algorithms. And it showed that quantum computers could actually be much faster and outstrip classical computers for certain problems. And in 1994, Peter Shor developed this quantum algorithm for factoring integers uh, that had the potential to decrypt RSA encrypted communication called Shor's algorithm. So five years ago is really when the quantum computing industry really took off. So we realized we can build quantum processors that actually harness quantum computing power. So we built this new system of computing using quantum bits or qubits and the last few years in the industry have been really exciting because of this. So while the technology is still in the early stage, we do really understand the fundamental physics behind quantum computing now because we discovered this a hundred years ago. So a lot of the work right now is going into exploring hardware implementations, processes, scaling, and understanding how to better control these quantum states. So this new system of quantum computing, what, what are quantum computers? What do they actually do? So a quantum computer is a system that uses the quantum properties of its qubits, like superposition and entanglement to perform computations. So not only does the qubit itself have to be a quantum mechanical system and quantum mechanical in nature, we also have to be able to take these quantum properties and utilize them to perform these calculations. 
So let's first start talking about the qubits themselves. So in the traditional binary approach to computing, you have the zeros, the ones on and off, and information is stored in the bits that are represented by that logic. But in quantum computers, we're based on qubits, quantum bits, that exist in a prob probability or superposition of zero and one. So you have, can have a 50% chance of it collapsing into a zero, 50% chance in collapsing into one, and you don't know which one it will be until you actually measure and break that superposition. So, but, but what can we do here? You know, a qubit is a two level system that's based on these zero and one states, and then it can exist in the superposition. But you can't really think of it like a regular bit when we can assign a value of one half and call it a day. So its special feature is the superposition, meaning it can exist in both states simultaneously. And there's really a lot of possible ways to make a qubit. So as long as you have something quantum that has two states that you can control well, it can probably be a qubit. So everything from pluralized light to specially prepared imperfections in diamonds and other systems that we have right now are superconducting qubits or trapped ions or photonics. So all of these uh, hardware implementations can be qubits. So entanglement is another fundamental quantum property we need to harness to do quantum computing. So when we say the particles are entangled, it means that the quantum states are linked to each other. So the state of one can't be described without the state of the other. So that means they're not separable. So this is a very purely quantum phenomena and it doesn't exist in the classical world because it's almost like information is spread across the particles and they're not they're not separated from each other. So if you take two particles that are entangled with each other and measure one of them, the state of the second changes even at a distance. And yeah, these this violates the laws of nature and it's just not very intuitive. And again, this seems very, very strange to someone who's very used to the classical world. So since classical computing emerged in the mid 20th century, we've had a lot of progress in the computer design and processing power has roughly doubled every few years and that's called Moore's law. But even if Moore's law keeps holding, there's a lot of classes of problems that actually classical computers can't solve efficiently, no matter how large supercomputers get, because the way that we solve them on classical computers is different than the way we'd solve them on quantum computers. So a theoretically perfect quantum computer can handle two to the n states. So it's a superposition of all n bit numbers, with n equaling the number of qubits that we have. So that means that 100 qubits can have the same computational power as about 10 to the 30 bits. So if we look at this in terms of classical memory and how, long, how much it would take to describe a quantum computer state, it really shows how powerful this is. So if we assume that each number is one byte at n equals 30, it's a gigabyte of memory at n equals 40. So 40 qubits is a terabyte and n equals 50, it's already a petabyte. So you see that even though we can simulate small quantum systems, we can't really simulate large qubit systems because that's how quickly the power of a quantum computer scales. So when we control these qubits, we do them with gates. And these universal gate quantum computers have really broad applications. And these systems work on building really performant qubits where we can do these basic circuit operations and gates and we can put them together to do any sequence and run more and more complex algorithms. But quantum computers have their own set of gates that are very different from the set of classical computing gates. So in classical computers, we have gates like AND, NOT, OR, NAND, FAN OUT to perform any of these computations. But these are irreversible gates because information is lost in the process of applying some of these gates. So when we do an OR gate on two, on two bits and we output a one, we can't reverse it because we don't know in this case if the first bit was a one or the second bit was a one or both bits were one because of the OR gate that we applied. And fan out requires cloning of a state. So we fan out the bit to a lot of other bits. But in quantum computing, we have something called the no cloning theorem, which says it's not possible to exactly copy an unknown quantum state. So we can't do that either. So for quantum computing, instead of using classical operators, we use quantum operators or quantum gates. And these are used to evolve the state of the qubits. So as I mentioned, quantum computing gates have to be reversible because re irreversible operations actually destroy the entanglement and superposition of the qubit. And we can't do that until the end of the algorithm when we actually want to me measure the system. So there's a whole set of these common 
uh, unary, binary, and ternary gates that operate on quantum states. Uh, these gates, like the X, Y, and X, Y, Z, and rotation gates, uh, the Hadamard gate, they can change the state of one qubit. And the Hadamard is the gate that actually puts the qubit in equal superposition of zero and one. There's also two qubit gates like C0, and they can entangle two qubits. And what the C0 really does, it's a controlled not gate, and it flips the state of the target qubit if the state of the control qubit is a one. There's also a CZ gate, which does the same thing as C0, but instead of bit flipping, it does a Z gate. And there's also swap gates where we want to swap the state of two qubits, which is important because it plays a role in efficient hardware implementation of quantum computing, even if it's not directly used to create algorithms. And there's also some three qubit gates, the Fredkin and the Toffoli gates. So those are controlled swap gates or the control, control not gates, which also gives us additional flexibility in applying these gates to quantum computing systems. So in traditional computer science terminology, the algorithm means set of instructions. But when we actually talk about quantum algorithms, we mean instructions that actually harness, harness these quantum properties of superposition and entanglement and can, can potentially solve these mathematical problems faster than a classical machine. So right now, there's actually only a few dozen or so well-studied quantum algorithms, but we're still in the early days for quantum computing and a lot more being discovered every day. So the, the ones that we do know though, the well-understood quantum algorithms can have huge impact on very important problems. So for example, optimization, chemistry, machine learning, quantum computers are really good at that. So for example, for properties of atoms and molecules, which is really necessary for material, materials research, drug discovery, and other applications like that, they can be found by solving the Schrodinger equation. So the problem is the problem gets harder the more components and atoms you add. So exact calculations are actually really hard above just a few atoms, and even approximate solutions are hard above a few dozen atoms. So you can't model these large atoms. And when I'm saying large, I'm talking about like caffeine or aspirin that has just a few dozen atoms. Like we can't actually classically simulate those systems anymore. They're too large. So Shor's algorithm is also just one of these dozens of quantum algorithms. Other algor algorithms like Grover's algorithm, they can actually speed up search on an unsorted database, which can be really impactful because the amount of data that we need to process right now in the world is growing really fast. So it could be useful for internet search companies, telecom data. Um, there's also algorithms like quantum approximate optimization algorithms and quantum unconstrained binary optimization. So they, they can really do really good job solving optimization problems like traveling salesmen, antenna placement problems, and graph coloring. So these problems become really quickly classically intractable or unable to be solved in these classical systems but they have a ton of applications like ranging from logistics, manufacturing, drug development, uh, new, new materials even. So algorithms like variational quantum eigensolver or VQE have major impacts in quantum chemistry. And beyond chemistry, the solution of these large eigenvalue problems would have more applications that really affect our day-to-day -day life, like designing new materials, whether that's new materials that help maybe airplanes stand up to higher heat or strain, or maybe, so maybe we could fly faster or create new batteries. So there's a lot of algorithms. Well, there's not a lot of algorithms. There, there are a few sets of algorithms, but they have a really broad application. And so that's why people are so interested in quantum computing as a field. So let's then talk about Shor's algorithm, since this is the first algorithm a lot of people hear about, and it kind of demonstrates this difference between classical and quantum systems. The two common crypto systems uh, that we have right now that can be affected by quantum computers are RSA and elliptic curve cryptography. So when you're online, any information that you exchange will be encrypted, hopefully, often with one of these. And both of these are really vulnerable to attacks by quantum computers. So RSA re relies on the hard problem of factoring numbers and Multiplying two prime numbers together is easy, but taking a very large number and factoring it to get two prime numbers is very difficult. So it would take longer than the age of the universe to factor a 4,000 bit key with a classical computer. But we're seeing that a quantum computer could do it maybe in a hundred seconds. And that's how fast and how dangerous this Shor's algorithm could potentially be. So, we have our hardware, we have our gates. How do we actually apply these gates and write quantum algorithms? 
So we have to find the prime factors of a number that can undo this factoring problem much more easily than a classical computer. And again, this algorithm was created in 1994. So we already knew that we could harness these quantum properties to do this. How Shor's algorithm actually works is by finding the period of a function. And this finds the non-trivial prime factor of a key. And there's five steps to Shor's algorithm, but only one of them actually step two is the quantum part. The rest are classical. So there's five steps to this algorithm here, Shor's algorithm. And a lot of the other steps are just checking steps and doing greatest common divisor steps. But step two is the important one. Step two is the quantum part. And what we're doing is finding the period of this function m mod n, m squared mod n, et cetera. So what's the period of a function? It's when you apply some operation and the results go back up and down like a frequency wave. So we can do this actually and look at this as a key here. So say we want to factor 25, and I know that's a very, very trivial example here, but it shows you what we're doing. So we want to factor 25 and we choose a random positive integer that's less than n and we choose seven. And we do this equation, this uh, m mod n, m squared mod n, and go on. And we, we see that since it's a modulus, the remainder when it's divided by 25, you know, the answer can vary between zero and 25, but or zero and 24, but the answer can't be above, above that. So even as the numbers get bigger, we can fit more 25s in and the remainder oscillates. So this function, as we see on the right, as we do this, actually has a period associated with it four, because once we get seven to the fourth mod 25, the remainder is one again. So when we plug this back into the equation, we can actually get the factors out of, the, of this. So the, the key to this algorithm really is to find the period of this function and then go through and do the common uh, greatest common divisor step in the last step. So what known classical function do we have that relates to frequency and time? It's the Fourier transform. So we have a quantum version called the quantum Fourier transform. And what it does is it maps the time domain to the frequency or the Fourier domain and frequency is exactly what we want to know here. And we want to do this really quickly because of the oscillation here of, of, this, um, of, this, of this period of this function. So again, this is kind of a trivial example using 25 or a number like that. But it shows the proof of concept to understand why an algorithm that uses these quantum steps is a lot faster classically. And how a quantum computer doesn't just brute force factoring. It's not parallelizing. It's not trying every possibility at once and just going through a list of numbers. We're actually doing something very different in, in the quantum step here. So now that sounds super exciting. So we're harnessing the quantum world. We have these algorithms with a big impact, but when can we actually run large quantum algorithms on them and get the results that outstrip these classical machines? And when should we really worry about this? So. In the end, we need about 2,500 qubits to break elliptic curve encryption and about 4,000 to break RSA encryption. But these are logical qubits and not physical qubits. And the difference between this is that quantum computers in real life have a lot of errors in them. Managing errors is important in quantum systems because quantum states are really delicate. We're really right now in the NISC era of uh, quantum computing, which is the noisy intermediate scale quantum device era. So our chips really have a dozen to a few hundred physical qubits, have a high error rate, a low coherence rate, and they may need a lot of error correction. So quantum information can only be stored for a short amount of time called the coherence time. And we need to apply all the gates and read out the data before the quantum bits decohere. So you'll often hear kind of that the quantum states lose superposition when observed. But what observation really means is measurement. And a measurement can be a controlled readout or it could be even interaction from the environment with a particle that interferes with the qubits. So from my work in superconducting qubits, we have a lot, we have cryogenics that cool the qubits down to a very, very low millikelvin temperature and RF shielding to stop this interference and lengthen the coherence time. And the problem is that quantum computers can't do the error correction the same way that classical computers do. In classical computers, a simplified view is that we can copy the string of bits that we want to send a few times. And then if the bits dis disagree, we can look into the copies and see what's a majority. But due to the no cloning theorem, the states 
that we have the quantum states, we can't exactly copy these unknown quantum states. So we can't do the same thing, but we do have an error correction techniques known as quantum error correction. And what it really does is it takes these states and encodes them into a larger quantum system. But that means the more complex a circuit gets, the more error correction we need, the more qubits we have to use. So as I mentioned for algorithms like Shor's algorithm, it would take about 4,000 qubits to break an RSA key, but these are perfect logical qubits. And Shor's algorithm is actually a very complex algorithm um, and circuit with a lot of sequential gates. So you have to do them in a certain order. And that's called a deep circuit versus a shallow circuit where you can do maybe gates in parallel and they don't have a lot of steps. So because of this error correction, we have to spread the information out. We have to keep the states coherent for a very long amount of time. We actually need a lot more error correction than for shallow circuits. So John Preskill noted in his lecture on quantum information that 10 million physical qubits would be needed and maybe 10,000 logical qubits would be needed to break RSA encryption. So we're still pretty long, pretty far away from that milestone. But a lot of people, and this is a chart from talking about kind of the research and how the field is going and what quantum information scientists think that, you know, when can we actually get to the point, get to this point to have millions of qubits? And it seems like around 15 to 20 years is something that people are thinking to get to the scale to actually have a threat to encryption. The great part about it is that there's a lot of really cool algorithms that need just a few dozen, a few hundred qubits that can help with these drug discovery with machine learning even before that. So we, we can get a lot of value from the quantum computing systems first before worrying about running Shor's algorithm. But even as I'm talking about the qubit counts, the number of qubits really isn't everything. So it's just one factor for power and I've already mentioned coherence time. So these qubit counts don't really mean anything if they're poorly constructed. And we have something called the Di Vincenzo criteria that tell us what a good quantum computer should have. So we need well-defined qubits, well-characterized qubits. We have to be able to initialize the qubits to an initial state. So we have to be able to set them to a good zero or one state. And we need a set of universal gates to apply to the qubits so we can do any sequence, any set of complex algorithms. And we need a long co decoherence times to preserve the quantum information for longer. So as I mentioned, we need enough time to apply the gates to do our algorithm and actually read out the data after that. And we have to have the ability to reliably measure these qubits because if we can't get the data at the end, that's also kind of worthless. So a few super fault tolerant quantum bits with long coherence times where Every qubit is connected to every other one, uh, ones that have good gate fidelity, which means you know low error rates in applying the gates. They're so much more valuable than hundreds of poorly connected, fast decohering qubits with a lot of crosstalk. So trapped ions and superconducting qubits are some of the leading candidates right now that do really well in these five factors of the DiVincenzo criteria. So a lot of companies are focusing on them, but there's a lot of other contenders, and some of them, like NMR, are well known to not be suitable for scalable quantum computing, but nuclear magnetic resonance was one of the first initial proof of concepts for quantum, quantum physics. But there's other qubit types that may not fit the criteria now, only because we haven't done enough research on them, and there's some physics problems still, still to be discovered there. So besides just looking at the qubits themselves, there's also criteria for how the whole quantum system has to behave to make a good quantum computer. So IBM introduced this quantum volume metric because this classical computer's transistor count and quantum computer's quantum bit counts aren't the same. So the quantum bits decohere and lose this quantum information very quickly. And what the single number, this quantum volume does is being more mindful about calculating performance of a quantum system. So it takes into account features like number of qubits, that's still important, but also gate and measurement errors, crosstalk, the topology or the connectedness of the chip. So you actually see here in the chart below, the latest stats are that a Honeywell 10 qubit system actually has a higher quantum volume than IBM's 27 qubit machine. And so th this really shows that the number of qubit counts is really not everything. So where are we at for getting the qubit ranges to actually destroy encryption? 
And note this kind of huge range in the roadmap that I've shown right now. And I've already talked about needing millions of qubits to break RSA encryption. And we are still looking at different hardware implementations here. So IBM is doing superconducting qubits, which are Cooper pairs or electron pairs or any other fermion with the superconducting qubits. Um, Cyclonum is using a different approach. It's doing photonics. So they're claiming 1 million qubits in five years, and they work kind of differently. So the thing is, every hardware implementation has its own challenges and weaknesses. So the important thing is when you're reading these articles, keep in mind that a lot of these will tell you the weaknesses of their systems and how there can be problems with scaling. So even though this is far away, we already know that security actually takes a while to upgrade. And let's think ahead, how will we mitigate the quantum computing threat to our security? So NIST has actually released this uh, competition for post-quantum cryptography st standardization um, a while back in 2016. And in July 2020, the sele selection criteria began. And there were about 26 algorithms submitted, and a few weren't viable after we had some public review. There's 15 left in this round. And they're part of pretty much three families that, that are lattice-based, error-correcting code-based, and multivariate-based crypto systems. So NIST does think that the initial, the eventual standard will have multiple recommendations for encryption. So in case someone manages to break this down the road, like I mentioned, there's only a few dozen quantum algorithms right now, and we're still working on and discovering more over time. So maybe there's something here where, you know, these crypto systems could be broken later on, and they'll probably recommend more than that. But the timeline for that is the new standard to be announced around 2022 to give people enough time to upgrade security. Because even though we talk about 15, 20 years to get to the point of breaking RSA elliptic curve encryption, there's, because of all the money being poured into the industry, maybe the scaling, the scaling will go much faster than we think. And we'd rather be prepared because in previous uh, changes in encryption has taken 10 years and a lot of money to upgrade. So we really want to get these standards um, going as quickly as possible. So what are the properties of this winning standard? So one, it must stand up to quantum computing attacks, obviously, but it also has to stand up to classical attacks because classical computers are also better at some other things and better at, at things than quantum computers and it has to be fast. So we don't really want to slow down communication. Um, this encryption needs to run everywhere and on the web, on smartphones, sensors, a lot of devices. So um, if we have the limited compute power, we don't really want to slow down the encryption. So a way of mitigating the threat also is using quantum cryptography. So as opposed to post-quantum cryptography, which uses classical techniques, it uses math, uh, techniques. The This quantum cr cryptography actually uses quantum mechanical principles of the superposition entanglement to create the shared key. And the positive here is that since it uses the laws of physics instead of our knowledge of math and our understanding of mathematical algorithms, it can't fundamentally be, be broken because we're using the laws of quantum mechanics. So one of these ways is the BB84 quantum key exchange uh, protocol that creates these shared keys. So physically we can think of this being encoded in photons and the polarization of the photon is the state. So what we wanna do here is Alice prepares a bit string that she wants to send and randomly selects the polarization basis. So she can select either horizontal or vertical or a diagonal one and uh, for horizontal, you know, that's the zero state, the vertical is a one. Or if you select the diagonal, you know, uh, up and to the right is zero and down and to the right is one. So physically, we can think of these bits being encoded in photons and the polarization of the photon is a state. And you can see that here in the angle of the wave traveling. So Alice prepares this sequence of photons sending the polarization. So let's say she selects the bit string zero one and chooses a horizontal vertical polarization, then the first photon she sends will be horizontally polarized and the second will be vertically polarized. So then Bob chooses whether to measure in the diagonal basis or horizontal vertical basis and doesn't know what Alice has done at that point. 
But the problem is that means he loses information when he randomly chooses the wrong basis. So if he chooses to measure a diagonal polarized photon in the horizontal vertical uh, detector, he's going to get a random answer and destroys the, the original. Uh, if you choose the correct basis, we'll be sure that the readout result is the correct one. So we detect and record the results here. And this can really be imagined uh, with like a polarizing filter and fancy sunglasses. So it works by only letting certain photons through the correct polarization. And the lack of a photon means the polarizing filter blocked it from transmitting. So then Alice and Bob publicly compare their encoding basis. So using the chart above, Alice says that for photon one, I use the horizontal basis. If Bob used the wrong basis and reads this out, the result he got was random. and they discard that bit in the sequence. So they keep only the bits where they match the measurement basis and they prepared the photon in the same basis as the measurement basis. And the shared key is that remaining sequence. So the cool thing about this is that Eve can come in and listen in on the photons if she wants to, but she's kind of in the same position as Bob is to choose a random basis. But however, as soon as she interferes with those photons, Eve introduces additional errors into the measurements. And so Alice and Bob can check for errors by choosing a subset of the key and publicly pairing it. And if there's more errors than expected, more than expected losses in the channel, they discard the key. So this has already been kind of going on. We have these quantum key distribution networks. And why don't we always use them if it's so secure and it's using the laws of physics? But it requires specialized equipment. So for example, for these photon uh, detectors, you need that, you need beam splitters and other equipment to make it work. So we can't put that all into a device like your phone. And just because the encryption itself is fundamentally secure by the laws of nature, nature doesn't mean that no attacks can ever occur. So that's even seen in our system. So right now these encryption techniques are secure, but there's side channel attacks and there's weaknesses in the implementation of the crypto system instead of weaknesses in the algorithm itself. So even though you can be sure that nobody has directly intercepted the photons in the process of creating the key in these quantum key distribution protocols, these attacks still do exist on quantum systems. So NASA has been doing research on this because they want to use these provably secure systems between Earth and low orbit satellites DARPA, Los Alamos National Lab have created small quantum networks as well. So even though those two are fundamentally different, both will have their place in strengthening security in a future, this post-quantum, large quantum computing future. But 90% of enterprise quantum computing investments will start hiring quantum computing consultants to figure out what problems that they can solve with quantum computers that would bring value. So it's worth noting that quantum algorithms are not the solution to every problem. So a big misconception is that quantum computers work by trying every possibility at once or that they speed up every problem. And that's not the case. So quantum algorithms are faster for a certain set of problems. And even though we only have these dozens of algorithms, the impact they can have is huge since optimization problems are everywhere and the differential between quantum computing and classical computing is massive. So if you wanna participate in the quantum revolution, what skills do you need to move from programming classical machines to quantum software? And actually it's not as much as you think. I personally believe you should need a PhD to actually use a quantum computer. And if quantum computers become mainstream, there just aren't enough quantum physicists in the world to run and manage all these quantum computers. So of course, this isn't a list of skills you need to become a PhD researcher, but it can get you started. So linear algebra is key. Quantum gates are just matrix operations and you need complex numbers and because imaginary and complex numbers are the core mathematical base of quantum mechanics. They, explore, they, they appear explicitly in fundamental equations like the Schrodinger equation. You need a little bit of set theory, but not too much. And there's some quantum specific notations that you need to learn. So Dirac notation or bracket notation is just a simpler representation of vectors and matrices of the state of the quantum system. You have the Hilbert space, which is a special kind of vector space um, that has some other special properties like preserving the inner product. Um, it takes the inner product of two vectors and outputs a scalar. And that's important in quantum computing is that it describes the systems containing the wave functions. And you'll need to learn the symbolism for quantum operators and gates. So that's not something you need before getting started, but when you look at the linear algebra and the gates, you'll, you'll see um, how that all connects. 
So you'll be surprised that just for running quantum programs, you actually don't need that much quantum mechanics itself. So on the software side, let's take a look at the quantum computing cloud landscape. So today's cloud quantum platforms are mainly hosted by large tech companies like Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and Google. And actually many of these are Python based. There's also languages, higher level languages like Q Sharp and Silk. Um, and then there's Open Chasm, kind of quantum assembly that's being integrated into the IBM cloud platforms. And I think Microsoft also has a connector to be able to do open chasm code as well. So Amazon's AWS bracket provides access to three different quantum computing platforms. And they also have simulators for prototyping and it makes it pretty easy to prototype and then put them on these universal gate quantum computers. And Amazon has just started getting into the quantum computing race, but so far their chip is not available on their own system. Azure has recently launched their own quantum platform with a goal of having the hardware and the software all under their quantum development kit solutions. And they provide access to the Honeywell and INQ trapped ion systems. And IBM has access to their own chips up to uh, 15 qubit chips available for the public to access. And uh, Google is also building out their own superconducting quantum computing chips, and they've released CERC and TensorFlow Quantum for, to allow the public to start coding with quantum computers, but they've not actually released public access to their chip, just the simulators. So to apply what you've learned today, next week you should debunk the myth that quantum computers parallelize or brute force solutions to problems. I mentioned this multiple times because this is a big misconception in the quantum space. And uh, I hope I covered enough interesting algorithms for you to actually look into them and see what might be interesting to your business. So in a year, you should start working on a skills plan to be able to program quantum computers in your language of choice. It's great that we have a lot of these Python-based frameworks and you can start learning the gates and have this minimum skill set to actually start uh, getting business value from quantum computers and thinking about how you can take problems and make them quantum. And in three years, you should really identify problems that quantum computers can use to extract business value. Thank you very much.